to get started. We just have a few announcements before we get going. There are a few positions with the chapter that we're looking for some help on. Uh, if anyone is interested in the vice chair position, uh, please see me. Uh, we also, uh, Joe Hoover uh, has just announced that she has to leave. She was named the president of Confer and she has some other things going on. So we're happy for her, but now we need a trails chair. So if anyone is interested in that, please see me as well. Uh, we are going to be having a uh, t-shirt sale, and I have to read this off because Jeremy couldn't make it last minute because he has some sick kids at home. So I'm just going to read quick uh, some things about that. Okay. We're going to be running a t-shirt sale from June 1st to June 16th. 16th. The, the shirts are high-performing wicking fabric that is very good for hiking and any other outdoor activities. They'll have the club logo printed, screen printed on the front, and they'll be available in multiple colors, plus short and long sleeve, in both men's and women's styles. The cost is very good. They're ranging from $14 to $17 per shirt, uh, plus shipping, and they'll be available for purchase from we're using a, an outside printing service to be able to do this, it'll be right through their website. Uh, since there's a chapter meeting uh, in the future that will work out timing-wise, we wanted to share this with people tonight. And there will be announcements made on our website as well as in our outdoor expo on June 8th. So we just want to get people a uh, heads up about that. There will be more information coming. That'll be an opportunity to. We got requests for shirts that have the Tennessee Valley logo on that, so we wanted to let you know. Okay, we have several announcements. Uh, they're all lined up over here, so why don't we start with Bart? What, what is today's date? Yeah. So what happens exactly one month from today at Menden Ponds Park? Expo. Expo, exactly one month from today. And so this is a quiz. How much does it cost to attend the outdoor expo at Menden Ponds Park? Free. Free. And what can somebody do at the expo? Uh, so you guys know what my position is other than <laughs> Okay, we'll come back to that. In case there's anybody who here has never of the Outdoor Expo. <laughs> ah, there's some folks. So at the Outdoor Expo, we have over 40 workshops that are free to attend on various outdoor activities. We have boats on the beach that you can paddle and test drive, and there are safety boaters out there that keep you safe. And there are all these outdoor organizations that come and tell us about all the wonderful things we can do in Rochester, hiking trails and uh, orienteering and etc. So it's a, a great event. So we need your help. We have these brochures available, which have the schedule on them and the descriptions inside. And we also have these lovely, out front. out front on the membership table, we have these lovely colored flyers. If you could assist us by taking some of these and distributing them to your friends and family and everybody else, and especially if somebody has never been to the expo, <coughs> you can share it with them to, to get their attention, have them come, and maybe post one of those at work or whatever, and you know what I do with mine? I tape it to my car. So when it's in a parking lot, people walking by, they, they, it catches their eyes, but you have to get used to people suspiciously walking by your car and peeking in the window. That's the only thing. So if you could help us distribute those, that would be great. But next question, how many volunteers does it take to make the expo happen? Lots. Lots. So first of all, Charlie is responsible for waterways volunteers. Charlie, wave your hand. And Denny and I, Denny's over here, are responsible for land-based volunteers. And we all like to thank you because we are getting a great turnout on volunteers. In fact, Denny and I just this week met and we put volunteer names in little boxes, assignments. And so we have a draft version of it. If you have signed up already and you're kind of curious what little box we put your name in, see Denny today. She has a copy of it. And if you haven't signed up to put your name in a little box, we still need names, especially in case somebody has a family illness or uh, last minute emergency and can't come to help us. We need somebody to be a backup for little boxes. 
So if you'd like to sign up or if you'd like to see what little box your name has been put in as a draft, see Denny uh, sometime tonight. And thank you very much for volunteering. We've gotten a great response. We appreciate it. You get free money. Oh, yes. And if you haven't volunteered before, we're only looking for like a two hour commitment. That's how big the little boxes are two hours. And you do get lunch. Okay? Thanks, John. Hi there, everybody. I, I just want to let uh, folks know about uh, a pretty exciting thing that's happening to our website. Um, a small group of us, well, basically Larry Telly and me, uh, have been working with a professional web developer, and uh, we are almost done with a brand new website that we expect to launch in about one month from now. Um, I, I think you'll find that it's it's a, a, a great looking website. It's actually modeled after ADK.org, and uh, it will look and, and and have the feel of that website also. In addition, the, the calendars are going to mesh with the main club's calendars also. Um, in addition, the, the the whole website should play very very nicely on things like tablets and smartphones and stuff like that. So we're really looking forward to launching this and I just wanted to alert everybody that in about a month's time, it's gonna go live. Uh, there will be an announcement in uh, the June Genesean about this and, uh, well, keep your eyes open.
Of course, there's a little catch with that invitation. I'm inviting you to dinner at my house on Wednesday, May 29th, if you would like to come and bring ideas for the program for next year. I will have dinner on the deck and with dessert and in exchange for your ideas and a little bit of help to uh, organize people who might come and speak to us next year. So if you have an interest in doing that, you can see the announcement in the Genesean. It is Wednesday, May 29th at 6 p.m. at my house. I will give you the directions when you are SVP and tell me you're coming. And I need to know if you're coming because I need to know how much pie to make, okay? So that's how it works. Anyway, um, that's how we've done it for a couple of years and it's worked out really well. So this year, tonight, we have a speaker, Jerry Fletcher, who is here to tell you about Botswana. He's, he's an, a longtime outdoor enthusiast and have, I'm, I'm going to let Jerry tell you his story. <laughs> okay, well, um, what, okay, all right. Yeah, we don't want to do that. Well, Dumelema, Dumelema, Otsigile. Ladies and gentlemen, hello, and how are you? Uh, so, we're going to do a a tour through uh, Botswana here. And when I first got the call, I thought I was going to be asked about how I survived all the stupid things I had done. Um, and I know I'm probably not the only one in the room, and perhaps we can have a future program on that to have five or six people come up and we can all share the stupid things we've done and survive, and if you didn't survive, I'm not invited. <laughs> So, um, so anyway, here, I'm just trying to uh, bring this up here to get it going here to make it work. Okay. Um, so the, the pictures I'll be showing are mostly to give a lot of context. It'll be a little different style than perhaps you may be used to hearing with other speakers. And the better photographer was certainly Don, who was on earlier this evening. Um, but I have a lot of images, some of them are in sequence, so um, they're probably, once I get done, uh, they'll probably be just be running through a whole lot of pictures uh, very quickly. They'll be self-explanatory, and uh, it's not going to be the National Geographic type photos. Don's the National Geographic uh, photographer. These were also taken from a moving truck and uh, with an old digital camera that experienced digital delay. This is the camera I was using as opposed to the fancy equipment that a lot of other people on Safari use. It's a, it's a nice camera, but it's not the same level as people like Don were doing. So where is Botswana? Um, it's there, it's south of the equator, most of the um, safaris you may think of are here, are over in Kenya or Tanzania and Lake Victoria on the border there between Kenya and Tanzania. And it's the wonderful um, spell and savanna grounds uh, that are generally fairly lush grasses and are the same sort of temperate climate that we are used to up in uh, the northern part of the hemisphere. So we were there in August, which is going to be the winter. And I did not have a particular plan to go to Africa, but um, I have a friend who was born there, his father was a British missionary, and he invited a small group of friends to join him on this. And um, I thought, well, if I'm ever going to do Africa, this is it. Uh, somebody who knows the ropes, the country, and the way around, and what tour company and all that, and the tour company were uh, friends of his. So uh, Botswana was basically, a before that, um, was a British protectorate in 1966, got its independence, and the fact that it was a British protectorate had something to do uh, um, with, I think, its stability. It's one of the most stable and fastest uh, developed uh, countries in, in Africa. 
while it still has about 20% unemployment, it's uh, generally doing a, a lot better than many. And then, so, of course, um, if, if, you want to, if you want to know more about it, how it's founded, there's a wonderful movie out called The United Kingdom uh, about its president and how he came to be president. And it's a very good movie I highly recommend. So, um, before I forget, I want to talk about uh, China does have a presence in that and uh, Botswana and a lot of Africa. They tend to bid for the construction contracts to build infrastructure and they can underbid the local companies, so they tend to get the uh, uh, projects. That's, a, that's good news and bad news. It's, uh, the good news is the government pays less, the bad news is they don't get the local jobs, but and they don't get the local, yeah, the, the local jobs, the local labor, because the Chinese bring in a lot of their own labor, basically. So the, the citizenry tend not to like it, and the quality doesn't particularly last. So they do get some infrastructure built, but the quality doesn't last. The uh, government in Botswana, as opposed to a lot of other countries, is anti-corruption and they're pro-conservation. They figured out something um, that other countries in Africa, like Zimbabwe, Zambia, and some other places, um, that allow hunting and, and tourism hunting um, Botswana figured out that, you know, there's more money in ecotourism by not killing off your inventory, but conserving it. And so, um, we, we get off to our adventure. Our first stop is in, oh, okay, this is my pack. We were uh, urged to bring soft luggage, and, and this actually weighed more than my checked luggage. Um, this had my laptop in it and other stuff, and this weighed about 45 pounds, and this I carried on the airplane. And this is just some thoughts on some travel wisdom about being prepared, because there will inevitably be problems and mistakes, and um, I probably made a few along this trip, and some of these are aspirational. I can't say I achieved every one along the way. And our first stop um, was perhaps one of our most memorable ones was in Heathrow Airport, where we spent a, a delightful 32 hours uh, traveling with my friend Joyce, who's over here, and God bless her for uh, for, <laughs> for her, her good good company and even humor through all of this. We didn't plan on spending 32 hours in Heathrow, but um, that's uh, part of the story that leads to this. Is um, because uh, uh, before we get to the uh, naked animals that you all came here for, they say the journey is its the journey and not the destination. Well, this stopover um, ended up being somewhat uh, pretty, pretty pivotal to the rest of the trip. But it wasn't long before we started seeing some uh, dangerous wild animals. And 
And I believe this is flying over the, the pond, uh, salt pond, and this is out of the airplane window, and this is sort of a big, ancient, million-year-old, millions of years old uh, lake bed. And here's what it looks like on Google, uh, Google Earth or Google Maps. And here we're coming in close to Mound, which is our destination of the flight. And this is the Thumalakami River. And I, I have a, a window seat, obviously. And we're coming in close. So this is uh, coming into Mound, and it's a city, so to speak, of about 55, 60,000 people. But it's uh, when I was looking out at the map to find out our information beforehand, I, I said, well, yeah, I'll walk around. I always like to get out and walk around in places, but this is what Mound looks like. Um, it's pretty spread out. Mound International Airport. And going through customs. And interestingly enough, the visitor line went faster than the resident line. And um, the woman in front of me as a visitor was uh, Botswana being a former British protector is part of the uh, Commonwealth and the, uh, the woman, and it's sort of like a free trade for citizens if you, if you don't know, but she was from Australia and she got interrogated mercilessly by the, the woman um, and I came up, it was my turn and I said to sort of like hello and boom, I was through. So I like to think that helped. Okay, I've got to switch things for a moment here. Okay, so um, this is the Okavanga Delta. The water comes from the highlands of Angola via two rivers, and it's testament to the fact that not all rivers flow to the ocean. Um, the, these uh, two rivers that become one river, the Okavanga, Okavanga River flow into the delta here. And just to give you an idea of the size of that, that's about, that's bigger, slightly bigger than the state of Connecticut. And, um, oh, I, I think I eliminated a lot of the pictures there, but uh, my little stay, a uh, bedroom stay in, um, in Heathrow, uh, led to a medical problem. And uh, yeah, some of the pictures or images are missing. Uh, I ended up, when I arrived on the ground in Mound, I couldn't get out of the car, so I ended up staying. While everybody else piled on the, uh, the, uh, the vehicles, I ended up staying a, a day behind, uh, getting involved with the healthcare system, ran into a wonderful local doctor uh, who uh, gave me some uh, cortisone part of the steroid injections in the hip, and a lot of wonderful medications. And, but I had to stay behind a couple of days uh, and to catch up with the rest of the group. I had to get a, pay for an extra flight out. And this is the pilot Leafa. And this is basically sort of an air track seat out there. And this is taking off from the airport, flying over some of the, uh, yeah, some of the grounds there. And here we are, we're flying almost due north at uh, 110 knots, I think. And then this is the Google Earth. So Mound is down here, down here. And uh, we're going to end up up around here at the end of the day. And giraffes down the lower right. Elephants around a watering hole, elephant watering hole, giraffe watering hole. And um, there's a rainy season and a dry season. And then we're there in uh, August, and it's basically uh, assured that there's not going to be any rain in August this, this particular month. So we were told that was a reason to choose the uh, to be there in August, and we could dispense with rain here, and it was correct. So we're at an altitude of 4,000 feet, but that's our sea level altitude. And if you're counting on that, um, don't, because uh, uh, you're actually have only about 1,000 feet uh, vertical above ground. 
The highest point in Botswana is about 4,700 feet, the same as Mount Colden. And here I am flying uh, into that with my airstrip. And I believe I found this, that this is the airstrip here. And, and here's the terminal. <laughs> and, and here's the, uh, the ground crew, it's a baboon troop. And we go immediately off into the bush there. And so I show these sort of, you get some sort of sense of the quality and the type of road here. And then I'm just going to try to keep moving through these fairly quickly because I think most of it will be somewhat self-evident. Except I'll say, you know, out of, out of nowhere, this is not a game park like you might find in South Africa. Um, this is the wild. Um, they are preserved, sort of like the way the Adirondacks or the Catskill Mountain Park is a preserve. They're just, it's wild territory. And Botswana has been very um, uh, conservation minded uh, about that. So you, we're traveling along at relatively slow speeds, and occasionally an animal will wander out. And here we come into the Moremi Game Preserve. And then you go along, and here's a wild dog in the bush, and you go in Pala come along and up oh, elephants, they say hello, they flash their ears at you to let you know they're aware of you. And, and here we have our lunch break and our food and meals were just fabulous. This was a private tour company. They say our friends um, arranged because they were friends with the owners and the owner of the tour company and his best guy were taking us out and the food was just fabulous the whole time. And this is a NASA photo of the Delta. And remember that Delta is um, uh, a little larger than the state of Connecticut. And then we go out on the there, and we were out for um, several hours. And it just seemed like, oh man, yeah, we've we've gone we've, we've gone way out here. And then you realize, man, this thing's huge. No, we haven't even touched it. And nice lilies. Oh, and this is part of my famous lens cap collection. Uh, I now have an international uh, part of it, and um, I'm, I'm planning on taking this into some galleries. <laughs> and in the background, these birds are uh, fish eagles, which aren't an actual eagle, but that's what they're called. Um, I forget the name of these birds up on the branch, but they're a, it's a great place for bird wildlife, um, a heron of, of sorts. Uh, more wildlife. <laughs> and this is about as far out as we got, and then we turn around, and then we get back in the trucks. And we're basically in pickup trucks, and yeah, I don't know what happened to the other group of pictures, but um, it, it showed the layout of the trucks and the fact that we don't have windows, we don't have any enclosures, we just climb in them. These here are wild dogs. They hunt in packs. And while they have scrawny, skinny little legs, they can be quite deadly. I think you recognize those. Uh, ung ungulate um, hoof prints there, probably giraffe. And then you come across a uh, zebra like this. This I moved, zoomed in a little bit. And this, this is a, a bird called, a, um, I think, a, a red-billed Franklin. It's, it's, it's a Franklin, I think it's a red-billed Franklin. They make noises um, that you pay attention to because uh, there can be a warning. Now, you don't know what the warning is. It could be innocuous or it could be, um, you know, some real danger to you. But when you hear them making a noise, you, you, you pay attention. And just to give you some idea of the landscape and uh, flora at the beginning here, um, this is uh, oh, a water buck. And these are guinea fowl, and they would just you know, come out occasionally all over. And this would be sort of our campsite. This would be a shower facility here that, of course, one of our trucks, we were in two trucks. Um, I think we were about 12 people, plus the guides. Our tents, you could stand up in those. You had your water basin outside. And you might have noticed um, when the picture of me um, in that wonderful bed accommodation at Heathrow, uh, I didn't have a beard. Well, I think after this night, um, I came out in the morning, my razor was gone, and now I have a beard. So there's some baboon out there who has a nice business uh, shape.
shaving. Here, here are some um, uh, uh, cranes of an endangered variety the next morning. Here's some salt. And this is sort of a typical bridge out there. And this is the lilac, um, uh, sorry, an iris uh, breasted roller. Some people call it the national bird. This is my photograph. This is my friend's photograph. So, but here's, here's the roller in flight. Uh, it's not the official bird, but uh, the colors are just iridescent and beautiful, and this is what one looks like in flight. But they, they call the roller because they fly up about 100 feet or so, and then they roll, they spiral down, and uh, it's just a really beautiful sight. And here's some cormorants. We're coming along a watering hole with some hippopotamus, and this is um, about as close as we sometimes get to hippopotamus. Um, they're mostly in the water. And we didn't see them out of um, out of the water ever. But the um, the big five uh, we saw four of the big five. The big five are uh, lions, uh, uh, leopards, uh, rhinoceros. Oh, how how can I forget these now? Um, but uh, I think uh, elephant oh, and Cape buffalo. I, I thought hippopotamus might have been in there too, but um, you, you might think lions are dangerous and will kill people. Actually, hippopotamus and crocodiles kill more people than lions do. Giraffes and the, the birds that um, feed on the insects, the symbiotic relationship there. And here we stop for a bit morning tea. Um, let's see if I can get this. This is, this is the tour owner here, Guy, Joyce here. This is Andrew, um, who was our host, who the one who was born in Botswana. And this is a road sign out there. And now Guy has gotten out to test the water that we're about to drive through. And I thought that was pretty brave for a number of reasons. Is one, you don't know what's on the bottom. Um, and two, crocodiles are, um, you know, all over the place in any body of water. So we drive through them. And, um, yeah, warthogs, they were the most skittish animals I recall seeing there. And this is, we come to what's called a gate. When you go in and out of, you transition from a preserve or a park, you pass through these gates. And I suppose they had some administrative function that I didn't really know. So here's one of our trucks. And you can see it's, it's all very open. Our gear is um, transported on top. Here's a bridge, and we walked across it. And this is the River Kwai. So that was the bridge over the River Kwai. <laughs> so here's Kwai. And we are out in the bush. Now, if so, there are no cell towers around, and yeah, uh, Malin there is about uh, 90 miles distance. But this little um, settlement of Kwai here, and then we're quickly back out in the bush. And, and this is still my first day. This is about the second or third day for other people. Oh, now I don't know if, if you can see anything, but there's some wildlife in there, which is why I included this. There you might see it a little better. These are kudu. And this is a magpie. And we're getting near the end of the day. And what we have at the end of the day, sundowners. Yes, we were well provisioned with beer and, and wine. Sundown and one of the other things you think about the African countries, one of the reasons that Botswana appealed to me also was I knew it was relatively stable. Um, and uh, for those of you who are deeply into religion, it's a Christian country. Um, and I say that only because you probably weren't thinking about this, it means they have alcohol, they have beer, wine, um, and amorella. So if you're going to an Islamic or Muslim country, alcohol is going to be prohibited. But the rest of the religion thing is just uh, not apparent, a, a non-issue. 
So the next morning, here's our guide, Ofense. He's uh, showing us about some lion footprints in the sand. And oh, you're driving along and boom, they see some more wildlife. And then we're off again, and yeah, the roads are not really roads, but we're driving through the bush on these uh, dirt paths, and here it is. We're... So what they do, um, our guides knew places to go, where to go, but sometimes they're communicating with other people or they're hearing things on the radio about what is happening elsewhere. So you end up seeing um, a wild dog den, and these are the aunties. While some of the parents are off hunting, uh, these couple uh, are watching over the little ones and see every, here the aunties are in the left of the screen but the trucks, the tourist trucks have begun to pile up and here's a wild dog and it's exciting in its own right no doubt but then these little guys come out oh and then we drive along and we find a, a bunch of lions during the day um, and I believe this is the lioness and there, here we have again all the tourist trucks that line up. But you get the general idea here, you get these open trucks with no windows, no sides on them. And this does get to be a little bit of an issue sometimes. And here we stop for uh, morning tea again. And notice the uh, back over here, the bushes, whatever. When you need to relieve yourself, whatever, we had something called a bushy-bushy where you get out of the truck, the men go to one side, the women go to the other side. You find a bush if you can, and then there were some questions I learned you just don't want to ask. <laughs> How do you know you don't have somebody who's already claimed that bush? I figured that was not a question I wanted to ask because um, you don't want you, you don't want to know what the answer here is. Um, so, but this will give you an idea. Um, you know. So they're, they're out there, um, and they're, the lions are generally nocturnal predators. Um, they're, they're not attacking man to eat, generally. Um, they're attacking uh, man as another predator, the way they will kill a hyena. So yes, they may kill and eat uh, a human being, but for the most part, they're eliminating their competition for their food source when they kill a person. And most of lion attacks happen at night between about um, 6 and, uh, I don't know, 9 p.m., and four times more likely in the 10 days that follow the full moon. So. <laughs> and here's a hornbill. And there we have some elephants. And yeah, they can come pretty close. And then we drive through, there are a lot of water things to drive through, an acacia tree. And uh, generally we had, because uh, Botswana, vis-a-vis -vis the equator, Botswana is about the same distance as Miami, Florida. So if you think Florida to the north, Botswana to the south, that's about what the distance is. It's roughly 1,700 miles from the equator. Uh, we had, being the winter, we had about 12 hours daylight, 12 hours dark, and uh, the legal requirement was to be in your campsite before dark, I think we were supposed to be at the campsite around 6.30, but by around 7 o'clock and definitely 7.30 it would be dark. And you didn't want to be driving around because you see a hole like that in the, in the uh, mid-ground there. Um, you didn't want to be driving into a hole like that. These, these animals are um, what you need power. So this is the crew that's taking care of us, setting up camp, doing the cooking, breaking down camp, digging the latrines, setting up the um, the, uh, the showers, oh, somebody's taking a break in camp. And here's a fervent monkey, and here's a roller, and here's a fence explaining elephant teeth um, on how they grind. Um, so elephants grow about six sets of teeth, they're all molars, and elephants die Basically, when their last set of molars uh, grows out, they can no longer get proper nutrition, um, and they basically tend to die of malnutrition, or get weak and then get killed off. And this is just some stuff that I thought was interesting passing through the countryside. Uh, they look like some sort of permanent settlements there, 
But these are some campers. You can also do a, a, a rent your own camping there, and that's what these people have done here. And toward the end of the day, we get these uh, egrets, uh, cranes, maybe ibises. I don't know if there's some kind of duck in the foreground. And here's another Franklin. They plan on... Oh, I did this one also because the lioness you see here, we're at dusk. It's almost, um, you know, we've almost lost the sun. She's gonna cross this little, wants to cross this little body of water here. But there are crocodiles there, and that's one of the few things that lions don't like. They don't like crocodiles because they can be a uh, victim and taken advantage of there. Um, so she stops and hisses there and takes her a long time. We watch her take a long time to finally try to jump across uh, this little bit of water. She jumps in the water, then you know, one or two bounds, she jumps out on the other side. And then she's followed by the lion himself. And there he is. Uh, hey, uh, you can't see this too well. Um, I can see it a little bit here. But you can make out his uh, you can make out his eyes. So we're going from Kwai, we're moving up here to a place called Safudi. And the Safudi Depression is another ancient lake bed. Um, that dep uh, depression area, I mean again it dried up millions of years ago, but it's three times the size of the state of Rhode Island. So here we are breaking camp, and, and the mornings are cold. Um, at night would be in the 40s, uh, low 50s, daytimes would be in the 80s. Uh, and here you have a crocodile, um, have a crocodile feasting on a, I, I was told it was a dead elephant, could have been a hippo for all I know, but I was told it was a dead elephant and a crocodile there. And here's a crocodile here. There were three of them there. And one of these things made me look into it is that um, crocodiles don't have regular tongues, so uh, it looks to me like he's kind of using gravity to help get, um, get the uh, meat to the back of his mouth where the peristaltic motion can start. And here we are driving along. Here's Kudu, who just comes right out in the road in front of us. And th this is typical, you might think of a deer, but yeah, ungulate, uh, in, um, impala, uh, kudu, uh, water buck, lechwet. And here's a self-drive. Um, I think this guy had transmission problems, so I'd always kind of wondered about, you're out there, you're in the middle of nowhere, you don't have cell towers. Um, you, what do you do, hit triple A, you know, no honey, you, you get out, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hunt the corn if there are any lions, but you get out and change the tire or to fix the transmission. Uh, I, this did not appeal to me. So here we are going across the Safudi, and I said it was, uh, it was very large. So this took hours to get into. And we stopped for lunch, and somebody walked away from the trucks. Um, uh, and um, so there was another fellow who uh, did that, and he got uh, sternly reprimanded. Why I didn't, um, I don't know. And then we're coming into something where the Sabuti Hills are. These are actually, would have been uh, islands in the ancient lake bed. The wildebeest. That baobab tree, and the, the, the folklore is that uh, for some reason God got mad at the tree, uh, uprooted it, and, and stuck it um, down, sort of, you know, crown first, so the roots were up in the air. And these are uh, quarry bustards. Uh, they look kind of like roadrunners, they're quarry bustards, right near our campsite. Here's our campsite in this movie, and I think we were here two nights, so it's, it's obvious we're moving along. Uh, we're moving along most uh, days to a new campsite, but um, a couple of them we stayed an extra night. And here's uh, dinner being cooked. The food was just fabulous. Uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner couldn't have been better. We had fresh, fresh baked bread every um, night. Uh, we had things like oatmeal and scrambled eggs for breakfast. Um, they, 
for those of us who are vegetarian, they had a vegetarian uh, dish at night. Um, this is what we have, a, a red buffalo weaver nest. And, oh, and this here is a leopard. We were very lucky uh, to see a leopard. Uh, we saw yeah, four, of the, four of the big five. The only one we didn't see were um, rhinoceros. That was the other one of the big five. But um, these were very hard. They're, they're solitary or singular, so that's what makes these difficult to see. And again, here's the traffic jam. Now, did you pick out the, uh, the cat, the large cat in this one? Right in the middle of the picture is around there is a, a cheetah. You can see that a little better there. And there, and there it's moving off. These are uh, ground hornbills. A furbit monkey in the tree. And this was just the largest tree you saw the entire time. I don't know, this was quite tall, maybe 70 feet. And there we go along. And, yep, and here you are. We come to some lions sleeping during the day. You might notice some of their feet positions on top of each other. And so after they've feasted or had a meal, they, they can go into a bit of a stupor. So this is sort of a better time to see them than at uh, dusk or at night. Um, where I have been reading since some stories about people getting killed or eaten by lions in the past few months. These were generally poachers who were going out at night, and I think most of us, or some of us at least, including myself, don't have a lot of sympathy for them. Um, eat, eat, kill or be killed, eat or be eaten, and the lions got the better of them. Uh, but those were at night in South Africa. So she wakes up. Uh, she decides the shade of the truck is pretty good. Now I'm in the back of the truck, um, so I'm just sticking my camera over the back there, and she's about four feet below me. And I was not leaning over and using the viewfinder. But here we are, so here, here you can see what the trucks are. So there, there's, a, there's a lion right down there, and this is where we are, only a few feet away. And then she decides she has enough of that, so she walks off, wakes some of the others, and they decide they're gonna go off. And here's a young male, a juvenile male. And they just wake off and they go off uh, further into some shade. Uh, he decides to join them. And there he is, and if you can see him there. So they, they can be fairly well hidden in the brush there. And this happened to be in the, the funniest, um, like, you know, within days after I returned. And here, um, yeah, it's an elephant tusk. This is really dense and heavy. And uh, our guide, uh, the, the owner, knew where this was. You're not supposed to move these around. So when he had found it, they didn't want poachers to run off with it. So he hid it in the bushes and told the authorities, you know, where it was so they could handle it and dispose of it. Well, the authorities never really came out to do anything with it, so it's been there sitting in the brush, uh, hidden in the brush, and when we went by, he pulled it out, and we took a look at it before um, returning it to its uh, safe storage place. But that is quite heavy. So here we are, here's um, Google Earth there. You can see these little sort of lumpy things, uh, dots. These are the Sabuti Hills. And here's one with some rock paintings on it. Uh, uh, these ancient rock paintings, we go up here, they are in the middle with elephant and whatever else that might be. Uh, there it is behind the tree up there. Now, this is maybe a third to the halfway up. And then some of us, being what we are, we decide to climb a little higher. Um, these people have all been excellent uh, mountain hikers and climbers. This fellow uh, climbed um, Mc Denali McKinley back around 1976. And so there's our little truck down there. And so here I am at the top. This is a, um, uh, I forget what you call it, but 
so so many of them are melted, um, to uh, uh, triangulate, mark a place. Now this feels great, you know, you get out here, you've been sitting in a truck, you, you've been flat land the whole time, and you're a person who likes to climb, so you're right there, and you know, you, you feel this is great, and you get this great view all around and a couple of other hills there, and then you begin to realize, I'm the slowest zebra out here, you know, and not only are we the slowest beings out here, I'm a wounded slow being here with, you know, a, a bad hip. Uh, uh, you know, which, which one's going to go first here? And so and then we began hearing the Franklins make their noise, and so it's like, get down now quickly. And um, uh, so, yeah, there's this steep face we had to hustle back down on. Um, 
One of the criticisms he heard was there was too much elephant dung on the roads. If the roads were too messy. <laughs> yeah, tell it to the elephants. We need to put diapers on them. More goats. There is a bit of a beef cattle industry. There's a small beef cattle industry in Botswana. It's a, it's a minor but significant uh, part of the uh, agriculture. Uh, because of Botswana's landlocked, they get their fruits and vegetables from um, South Africa, basically. In general stores, this was the only uh, petrol station we found. It wasn't operational yet. It was just in the process of being constructed. Bus stop with the national colors on the garbage can. People walking down the roads. Baobab trees. Oh, this is sort of like a picnic park. So the government did make a number on the highways where there was pavement, a number of picnic parks. Um, another, again, roadsides we don't see a lot of. Now, even when I was in Malin, I, was, I like to go out and explore around and walk around my cities and places. I was told not to do that even in Malin. Is very spread out, uh, things were not close, and I kept pressing, well, why not? Well, partly is it's hot, it's spread out, and no one would really answer me, why not, except to the extent I could read between the lines or get a vague, faint reference to. Um, there were dangerous creatures on either four feet or two feet uh, at night, but uh, nobody wanted to talk about it much. So we're into Chobe National Park here for a couple of nights, and somebody's doing a boat crew here on the, on the river, the Chobe River, and here's some zebra crossing, and now they're crossing the road, different, different uh, group. And what are these? Oh, these are uh, kudu. And they just came up and they crossed in, in front of our, uh, in front of our truck. And there's the uh, male. And here's a nursing one. And here we're coming into our campsite for the night. And here we're unpacking. And here you get a, an idea again, a picture of the trucks. And here we have our baboon greeters for the evening. We were camp right near um, a troop of baboons. And the next morning, up bright and early, and um, yeah, what, what do you do, because predators, lions are out at night, what do you do for those of us who, you know, have a call of nature um, that you don't want to answer, but nature calls and you need to go outside the tent um, at night? Well, uh, we're told we had the uh, headlights on our head and we said, well, let's uh, flash the light in the, uh, the lion's eyes, it'll temporarily blind it, and it'll go away. Yeah, that's great. What about the one behind me? <laughs> so um, it got to be, needless to say, that, that, none of that, that didn't happen to any of us, but it was uh, a kind of an unnerving experience, uh, you know, most nights to get out there. And especially when you find out in the morning uh, there are lion footprints in the um, roadway only 35 feet from your tent. Baboons were up before us. More lion footprints. Cape buffalo. Oh, um, yeah, back to the lions. Um, yeah, one of those nights that we were there, uh, sort of like getting around bedtime, if you will, maybe 6.30 or 7 o'clock, um, I, I heard some noise. One I, I, one I couldn't identify, and the other I could clearly um, identify as a, a, an elephant trumpeting. But the other one was like a mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, Whoa, what's that? It sounded like a hundred yards away. And the guy said, that's a lion. That's the, that's the way a lion roars. He said, ah, don't worry about it. It's like a half mile, a mile away. Said, yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, by the way, I looked it up since. Um, lions run it uh, up to 50 miles an hour. Uh, zebra and, um, and one of the other ones there run at 40, up to 40 miles an hour. And um, Hussein Ball has been known to get up to 28 miles an hour, while the rest of us are generally around 10 to 15 miles an hour running. 
And these are the, um, uh, the, the red something or other birds that I had the uh, buffalo uh, birds I mentioned earlier. So there's fishing on the Chobe River. It's a, a very dangerous occupation because of uh, crocodiles. Somehow a second man got on the same boat. And here's looking back, just to give you an idea of the landscape. Oh, and here in the middle of the picture, sort of framed by the tree. Now this is from a moving truck. Um, so, um, and I'm dealing with digital delay and stuff. So some of these are just like really um, on the proverbial of literal. Um, this is a military post on the edge of the river because on the other side of the river is um, Namibia. And while um, Botswana is very protectionist and conservationist, poachers will try to come over from Namibia. And so they do have military patrols on the river and this one like on the, the bank of the shore. Impala. Impala. Cape Buffalo. And yes, they're sometimes they're in herds. Uh, here's another roller, uh, iris breasted roller. Lila breasted and uh, elephants in the shade. Fervent monkey. Kudu. Elephant along the Chobe and their gate. And here we're leaving the park for the day. So we're up along in here somewhere in the river. And we're coming in, I'm not exactly sure what community there is, but here's a roadside stand. And it's told generally people didn't want you to take their picture for whatever reason. They didn't want you to take the picture. And so when one woman waved me off, I honored that and didn't take the picture. And so now we're about to go into a river cruise uh, that launches out of this place, the Chobe Safari Lodge. So it's a nice little place, not the tents that we were sleeping in. And here we're going down to the boat. Here we go out on the, oh, now this is the Zambezi River, um, which is yeah, one of the largest rivers in the world, maybe second only to the Nile in Africa. Um, it's about over 2,800 kilometers, so yeah, being that about 1,800 miles. And I showed this one here just so you can appreciate this one. And why somebody would design this, I'd like some engineer or architect to tell me. And on the banks of where we have the, uh, the warthogs down on their knees feeding. And here's here in the middle, if you can make it out, is a monitor lizard. This is not a monitor lizard. <laughs> You stay away from these. And this is how close we were. And they had the, the bow of the boat up on the shore. And so then we go out and to So lots of wonderful birds, heron, ibis, elephants, egrets. Uh, up in the treetop there are a couple of fish eagles. Mr. Crocodile. Here's part of the river patrol. And th this is a little, fa a little family. This is a, a family uh, of elephants crossing the river. Um, and pay attention in the next ones to a uh, junior or uh, back here. And then, uh, yeah, so there are some people who would uh, rent these that you go and you camp on the river on. Um, there are some birds up here, and these are their nests in the mud. Lots of crocodiles. And yes, they do actually have some brick buildings, brick and mortar. And shopping places to shop for food. Uh, and as we were leaving, going back to our uh, tent site, we were told there were some lions up the road. So we traveled along, we waited to, we kept an eye out, and indeed, finally, we um, found this uh, lions. Now, most cats are solitary, like we saw the cheetah and the uh, leopard earlier, but lions, um, you know, hunt are more social and uh, hunt in groups, and they can be very effective that way. And, and part of the way that they kill is they use their own body weight to drag um, another animal down, and, and once they begin to get a hold on the animal, they often bite across the mouth or the muzzle to suffocate it. 
So anyway, so we found this lion group here. And here's a juvenile in the middle um, and chewing on a beer bottle. And here he picks up the beer bottle. And then uh, Mama, the lioness, uh, looks to me like she's scent marking. Um, I'm not sure if females do that, but uh, something's going on. And sometimes I've included parts of the truck because I just had a necessity, and other times I include parts of the truck to give you some perspective that yeah, these are not long-range shots. And then they all come up to the lion, and something goes on here. Um, didn't wasn't quite clear what provoked what, but man, I tell you, when that's happening, only about 30 feet away from you, it really catches your attention. And we sat there and we watched these lions for a, a long time, and I'm talking like over half an hour. Um, and after about half an hour, I'm, I'm sitting in the back of the truck, and yeah, this is the this is the lions out the back of the truck that I'm looking at. And I said to the uh, owner, you know, okay, I, I think I've seen enough. And he goes, well, I haven't. <laughs> oh, okay. No. And here, here's the lion scent marking the bush. He did this on several bushes. Because the lions have territories also. So, um, yeah, one of the things I didn't think about or realize afterwards, once you saw uh, some lions you in one place, because they have large territories, you're not likely to see lions again for a while unless you're near a territorial border, uh, which you can probably tell if you're a lion, and I'm not, so can, I couldn't tell, like, you know, whether are we in one lion's territory or another. I hope we're not going to see the next lion's territory. But you're, you, yeah, you know, if you see the lions in the bush there sleeping and you need to go out to go bushy bush and relieve yourself, you have some degree of confidence that, you know, a quarter mile away, you're not going to run into more lions. But this will give you some idea how, you know, close things were. The other thing that was interesting about this, we stopped here and another truck like ours stopped with us, but there was only the driver, no passengers, in another um, enclosed door car. Um, this other truck, when we, the lions walked off, he started to go up again and his radiator had blown. So all his uh, cooling is out on the road. Um, we're about 6.30, we're going on 6.30 when it's getting dark. It's, you're required to be at your campsite and you're only within feet of major predators who begin to hunt in the following hours or minutes. And your, vehicle, your open vehicle that's not enclosed does not move. Um, I figured this was not a real happy situation for this guy. We did give him a push start and got him going, and I figured he probably just cooked the engine of his truck, but um, it was not an easy, or maybe it was an easy choice to make. And here, here we get sundown, okay, the next morning. This group, here's a jackal. <coughs> Hippos. Um, fish eagle, uh, hornbills. Now that night, some lions yeah, had uh, killed a Cape buffalo and they're off in the distance feeding on the carcass. And we're somewhere, this might be nine in the morning roughly. And the, the, yep, the, the vultures come in, I hear, I hear the, the vultures. Um, and then it's, it's, yeah, a couple of the lions in the background there are having some sort of little uh, dispute on uh, who's turn it is to take the next bite. And then they begin wandering off toward the trucks. They come in the whole bunch. This is a very large, um, <coughs> I keep going to call them herd, but they're not. They're pride, yes, pride of animals. Uh, eight lions. They come and hang around our trucks. And so here's uh, our tour operator with his camera. And this is about the most we had to shoot. With. There were no weapons involved. Nobody had a weapon, no firearms. Uh, about the biggest weapon we had was I went and had a two and a half inch blade folding knife that I used to cut tomatoes and cheese. And that was not going to be much use uh, in any of these situations. So, yeah, she's close. She's looking at us. 
But my understanding was that um, as long as you stay in the truck, you're okay. The lions have got acclimated to the silhouette of the truck. Um, they do not see the truck as a threat. But if you get outside the truck and they see a, a human silhouette, um, then you're in trouble. So onward we go, and here we are at Kasana International Airport, we, are, we do an exchange. This is the end of our part in the wilderness, um, and we go off, um, our tour guides end here, but our tour continues to um, Victoria Falls over here. So, where are we? Okay, so we're leaving Kasana here, and we're driving over to Victoria Falls here across the rest of the way in a uh, private sort of shuttle. So we come to the Zimbabwe border here and you just stand in line in the heat, with shaded heat there. They have nice flags you can look at for Zimbabwe and something else. And here's their wonderful tourist photograph you can look at of uh, Victoria Falls in uh, full flood. And here's a fervent monkey. Uh, yeah, you go through uh, some of the, uh, the border controls or places here, and you'll find baboons and monkeys crawling over the vehicles. And I thought, so this is you know, the process you, you go through, and I thought it was also interesting, B number two, pay a carbon tax. And here we are crossing the border, a little different from going uh, over the Lewiston Bridge or um, Bridge over the St. Lawrence River. And here, here's the here's the border guard. So here we are coming into uh, Victoria Falls, where is going to be our last one or two nights in visiting the falls. And here's our we have a gated hotel after being out and roughing it in the the bush, the woods, the brush. And so this is our nice hotel room, a little different accommodations in the tent. Um, and you generally keep the, um, while it's lovely and nice to have um, a terrace balcony out there, which we enjoyed uh, with a bottle of wine at the end of the day, you keep the doors closed because you know, monkeys will climb up in the trees and uh, come in your rooms. And, and, but they don't pay, they don't pay their way. So I, had, I was leaving the next morning, so my only time to see Victoria Falls was that night, and I had about only an hour, and it was maybe a kilometer walk from the hotel, and so I hustled my butt over there because um, I had only yeah, a little over an hour to see the, the falls. And um, this is a very informational sign, just in case you wanted the information for yourself. When you go there, you can see what the hours are and, and how much they charge. So the first one you come in is Devil's Cataract at 73 meters, and this is sort of the layout of the falls. So um, starting down here, so you come in at the entrance gate down here, traverse this over to uh, number two, the Devil's Cataract, and then going all the way out here to something called Danger Point, and that's roughly a mile out there. Um, so I figured I had uh, about um, yeah, 20 minutes to get to the the uh, gate and pay my entrance, uh, 20 minutes to uh, uh, traverse this mile and then 20 minutes to get back and that would be my hour. So this is the Devil's Cataract. And this is the Main Falls. And this is out at Danger Point. And that's the outflow from all of the uh, falls there, where the Zambezi River continues downstream. And this is looking back upstream through the gorge. And I, I just, the, the, when I saw this, I was just thinking Schweppes Girl, if any of you remember that ad. Um, of the, the young woman at a rock to uh, sell the uh, soft drink um, Schweppes tonic water. And somehow, I don't, I don't know how this was, the people up here in the middle got were on the other side of the, the falls. It's not, it's not an easy thing, so where, where they came from, how they got there is a mystery to me. 
And then they did have some very good um, informational signs there. So, oops. So, yeah, here is the, the headwaters of the river up to the left. Comes down the Chobe River, comes in, joins it. Uh, Victoria Falls are right here in the, approximately the middle, and then flow downstream and ends up in the Indian Ocean. Oh, there it is, okay, 2,600, 2,700 kilometers, fourth longest river after the Nile. Um, Now, how, how do you measure a large waterfall? Victoria Falls, I think we'd agree, is pretty large. And so they say, how does it compare to the other great waterfalls of the world? Um, Niagara's the um, least tall, the shortest, if you will. Um, Iguazu is next up about twice, a little, a little less than twice uh, Niagara. And Victoria Falls is um, a, a good bit uh, higher. But then you can also measure not only by the height, but by the width or by the volume of water. And interestingly enough, at least to me, was that Niagara, while being somewhat the smallest um, in physical dimensions, height and width, has the greatest water flow of it. But um, th this gave me a little bit of pleasure because I've now been at all three of the, what they call the world's great waterfalls, uh, Victoria, Niagara, and Iguazu. But they, they agree there's something of, um, of uh, you know, subjectiveness with all this. Yes, if you're going to get literal about what's the highest waterfall in the world, then it's Angel Falls in uh, Venezuela. Oh, and so I was in such a hurry to uh, get over the waterfalls, I didn't, in a rare moment, I didn't pay attention to my path out, so I couldn't find my way back to the hotel, except by recognizing the long route um, on the pavement and uh, as I got closer to the hotel, I saw this interesting sign of the, the railroad, the train, so I went to take a picture of that, and it happened to catch these women there who um, started waving at me and objecting because uh, they thought I was taking a picture of them. And I got up to them and I told them, no, I wasn't taking a picture of them, I was taking a picture of the sign, and I showed it to them. Well, that didn't mollify them. They, got, they, were, they wanted me to delete it, and they wanted me to pay for it, and, um, Anyway, we had a, a, an, an unhappy encounter. Um, uh, there are the three little pigs here outside our hotel gate and in, in front of the hotel. Wonderful uh, statues. And oh, finally getting to do some laundry, hanging it from the, the, the what I had worn for about 10 days, finally got washed. <laughs> a lot of grit went down the sink <laughs> and it's uh, drying from the fan. Okay, so here's, um, here's the inside of the hotel grounds with all these waterways and bridges and stuff. And you could easily get lost in this hotel, not rec recognize where your room was. But I, I showed this to show the context for the next one, which is one of my favorite signs. And then uh, this is Livingston Airport. We've got a, a ground transportation from the hotel across the border into Zambia, where Livingston uh, is Livingston Airport to fly back to Johannesburg. And you know we really have to get these into Rochester Airport here, and uh, you know upgrade the classiness of Rochester here. But you know you don't get this everywhere in the world. I thought this was just wonderful. Uh, and oh, here's our fair traveler back in Toronto Airport. Yeah, beginning of his beard. And uh, that's where Botswana is in the world. Um, and again, so, you know, be prepared, relax and enjoy it, learn some basic phrases in the local language and local customs. Uh, be polite and courteous, make some friends. And um, uh, it's not that I'm able to do these all, all the time, but to have these as some goals to, uh, um, you know, and then I thought I'd close with these quotes here. So, 
Tu me la ra, tu me la ma. Thank you. So if you have some questions, I can take some now, and if um, I can also, you know, take some, uh, hang, hang out up here afterwards and uh, take some questions for you. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed it and found it, uh, you know, educational and informative. Good night. Thank you.